for example, are um, uh, trawlers and ferries. And I will ask the charming, what's, let me see, where's her name? I oh my God, she's gone. <laughs> Eva Beikirch, Eva Beikirch, she's the general manager at Navisense, and I think she's coming. Yes, there she is. And she will introduce you to the three speakers, Tobias Haag, Dirk Lehmann, Evangelos Frakoulis. I think Professor Captain Michael Vaas is not there because I think he's sick. He's sick, he couldn't come. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Hello, hello. Um, yes, my name is Eva, and I have the pleasure of hosting today's panels about how to make small ships clean. And uh, we start with a little introduction of our panelists. And yes, I think Tobias is about to start. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me here on uh, um, CDEFCON uh, this year. A uh, special uh, place here. I think the last time I was here was on the Harbour birthday two years ago. Could ha who could have imagined that actually things turn out that way? So I'm uh, the CEO of uh, Hadak, which is the ferry operator here in the port of Hamburg. You can see a lot of our ferries up and running when you look to the other side of the boat. Uh, we operate 26 uh, ferries here. All of them on diesel, 10 million passengers in a year, at least in a normal year. Uh, we are running on uh, eight routes um, and we are operating actually uh, almost 24, only 21 hours a day, but uh, seven uh, days in a week and all year long during fog and winter, we don't care. On top of that, I'm um, responsible for the Alster Lake boats. That's uh, 18 of them, two on the of them already running on batteries. We accepted the challenge going emission free and uh, I will share a little bit uh, what we are planning there and what we are doing uh, in this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. I'm next. Dirk? If I'm next. Oh, that's yes. a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, my name is Dirk, Dirk Lehmann. I'm a native Hamburg guy um, and uh, I'm, yeah, I'm Becker Marine Systems CEO where we do radars and energy saving devices and battery systems. But uh, since some years also, I'm involved in LNG, so I operate an LNG vessel here in the port of Hamburg to produce clean energy out of natural gas uh, for Hamburg, uh, also thermal energy. And also, I operate a small ferry here in Hamburg, uh, a battery hybrid, by the way, um, which we operate between Hamburg and Stade and Wedel. Um, and I do convert trucks, buses, ships and boats into hydrogen and electric, whatever you like. Whatever is mobile, we can do green now, not tomorrow. And um, yeah, my demand is uh, build us a fuel station on hydrogen and we will have the ships as soon as possible here. Okay, thank you. Evangelos. All right, hi everybody. My name is Evangelos Fragulis. I'm actually Greek. I live in Sweden and I work in Denmark. So a very complicated <laughs> life. There you go. <laughs> uh, I'm the chief technical officer for Switcher. So I'm overall responsible for the technical management of uh, 440 plus tags uh, operating worldwide. I'm a naval architect and marine engineer as a, a that I have studied, and uh, I've been with the uh, Epi Muller Mars Group for 10 years. Uh, within Switzer, of course, we we also very keen on our decarbonization journey. So we look, uh, we are very open to to look on uh, ways to to decarbonize our fleet right here, right now, and also what are the future options for the next tugboat of of the of the future. So I'm very much looking forward to this panel talk, and uh, nice to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yes, I think we can take a seat. I'm All going right. to sit here among mm. among the panelists. I think officially the host is supposed to sit over there, but that looks a bit risky, so <laughs> I, I make myself comfortable here among you guys. So um, thank you. So um, in the beginning, I'd really like to understand a little more for what's your understanding for a clean ship and what your organization or um, your company is doing to, um, to get there to get to res this result? Maybe Tobias, you want to start first? Yeah, that's a good question. I started uh, this road three years ago and it was uh, pretty clear that uh, we have to develop a strategy for being completely carbon neutral with our fleet. Uh, that is of course uh, a political decision that has been taken here in Hamburg, but I think as a public transport company, I think it is a quite natural strategy to go for. So uh, we are running purely on diesel here on the on the river um, and uh, we established a team uh, just uh, shortly after I started uh, to develop ideas uh, how, how we could uh, approach that. 
and uh, we have actually put all options on the table that are technically available or will most likely be available in the next future. And um, then we have decided to set our sales and follow the plan and go for a plug-in uh, hybrid um, Perry uh, with a lot of battery power on board. Uh, unfortunately, there is a limit in ship size here in Hamburg, so the ferries cannot be much longer than 30 to 33 meters. Um, so there is limited space and also um, displacement available for batteries. And that is why, why we have decided to, uh, on top of the batteries, go for hydrogen um, as a next step. Okay, interesting. So just to understand you correctly, um, it's, it's a plan you made uh, in the past. So how far did you um, progress now with Hadak? How many Hadak ferries are actually uh, either plug-in hybrids or um, with an alternative fuel than diesel? All of them? Or they are still all on diesel. So the, the project with the battery ferry is now up for EU tender. So everybody actually wants to uh, bid on that project. Uh, it's not too late. Uh, <laughs> You can still register, and uh, we would be, of course, very happy if uh, there is a lot of shipyards and suppliers uh, that uh, are interested in that project. So that will be, uh, uh, it's actually a two-step tender. First uh, three ships will be uh, plug-in hybrid vessels, uh, but still with a diesel generator, and uh, the, the other three vessels will actually come, hopefully, with uh, hydrogen uh, power already. Um, there is several challenges why we cannot go for hydrogen uh, from, from the start. Um, there are still no rules and regulations available for inland ferries or inland vessels uh, with uh, hydrogen. I think we have rules for seagoing vessels, now interim guidelines for, I think, two weeks. Um, but for, for inland vessels, they say that it will take another couple of years to, 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 to get to that uh, point. So what we did, uh, we designed the ferry, we did risk assessments and uh, what have you, and then we applied for a special permit we are still in the process uh, at uh, the Commission for the Rhine to get this, um, to get the permit to, to, the, uh, to build and uh, operate the ferries. And on top of that also we need funding. So we applied for funding for the hydrogen project uh, because it's not as cheap as the diesel. Okay. Otherwise we would have done it already, I guess. Okay, so uh, quite a few steps to take, but you're up to it. I can see that you're determined to go there. So <laughs> yeah, very good. Dirk, maybe you can also share a little bit what's your understanding for clean ships. Is it only um, emissions or is it maybe also the noise? Um, what, what's your understanding there? And uh, what are maybe you can share some projects uh, you're involved with in the pursuit of, of getting there. Yeah, there are many steps to be done and uh, we have to separate ships to ships. We're talking about small ships here, uh, meaning that what is mainly inside the harbor or near to the coast. And uh, here we have a mix of inland waterway rules, we have seagoing ship rules, so it's depending on what kind of project uh, we are. Um, well, we are in projects uh, for making ships clean, and clean means without emissions, uh, mainly um, emissions which are going through the air, like noxes, uh, soxes, CO2, and others. But um, if you want to make a ship clean, you can wash it, that's clean. Um, if you make it uh, noise-free, I think that's impossible. We need a propulsion organ in order to drive the vessel. Um, you see here there's a sail project. Um, we are in other sail projects than on car carriers in the moment. Sail is one thing you can do on a vessel to save energy, but you will not be completely emission-free with a cargo carrying ship sailing over the seas unless you only transport a few amount of cargo. But if you want to have a lot of amount of cargo, you want to be weather independent, a sail is an additional propulsion, but that is emission free, uh, also noise free. Um, so there are many ways to go and one thing is definitely hydrogen, we will go the hydrogen way. I also operate a uh, ferry here on the Elbe and this is already a battery uh, hybrid vessel. Uh, next one will be with hydrogen and if we cannot bunker hydrogen here in Hamburg, we have to do it in uh, Lower Saxony. In the, in the city of Stade, where there the authorities are very open to hydrogen. They want it and they do it. And this is a difference to here, where a lot of people want, but they don't do. Because it's no problem to open a hydrogen station. Um, it's just to be done. And if hydrogen is available, and in Lower Saxony it is available, green, gray, blue, whatever color hydrogen they have, um, and you can use it. So just install it on the ship and make it. And um, the technology is there. There is no reason not to do it. Uh, it just has to be done. Okay, interesting. Thank you. 
Well, to the, much to the disappointment of uh, Boris Herrmann, wind apparently might not be the most feasible solution for making ships clean. Um, what's the opinion of Switzer in that respect? All right. I mean, <laughs> uh, when, when you look at the clean, there, uh, for me, there is uh, three elements. One is, of course, clean is uh, all about the emissions. Uh, the, uh, the other element we need to look at is our crews and, and how comfortable they are to operate with uh, clean energy. And the third element, which is equally important for an operator like us, is what do the clients believe? So for me, apart from going into deep dive and understanding, okay, which is the new technology we need to use, there is a lot more that we have to have in our minds. And that's where within Switzer, that's also where we also spend quite a lot of time. Because for us, it's, uh, we do have uh, projects where we have deep dive on, on battery types. Uh, we have also done deep dives on uh, yeah, dual fuel, LNG, Methanol is the, the new blue, uh, the new black uh, from Mars side, and and we do have a lot of studies there, uh, and, and and again it's it all goes down at the end of the day how much more we can collectively do in the industry so we can also convince our clients that this is a good solution because uh, I've been involved into uh, into a, a lot of new projects and all the clients are super excited about new energy and decarbonization but when you go and do the real talk and, and, and bring up the figures that comes up. I think that's an uh, interesting expression that we usually get. With uh, real talk, you mean uh, the money. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> so, okay. yeah. uh, so for us, again, uh, we, we are on embarking on a new journey together with uh, our big company, Marsk. Uh, we also have a new head of decarbonization in, in our uh, department. And we're slowly, slowly uh, coming up into, in, into what we believe will be the new uh, fuel that we need to use. So we, we do have in our fleet uh, hybrid tags. We, we also have built a tier three tags eight years ago. Uh, so there is a lot of traction, but uh, to me, I believe that right now, right here, the technological maturity, considering the operating profile of a tag, I, I don't think it's there yet but very keen to learn more and very keen to engage with everybody uh, in the industry and learn more and, and find these solutions. Yeah, and actually you um, you touched a very interesting point in yeah. respect of uh, customers. Mm -hmm. So are customers actually willing to embrace the idea of sustainability and uh, maybe not only in theory, but also in practice, meaning yeah. uh, they may pay a higher price. Mm -hmm. um, so we all as a consumer may pay a higher price for our flip-flops we order via Amazon, which is yeah. then delivered, or as a passenger going on a Haddock ferry, yeah. um, where maybe a ticket may cost more, I don't know, uh, with the hybrid ferry, or? I think that would be hard to go for. Um, I mean, you can run our ferries basically with a bus ticket, and uh, I think that would be a little bit strange from a political uh, uh, point of view if you would... Uh, actually punish people uh, using public transport in order to uh, uh, to subsidize uh, the greener um, propulsion for the ferry because I mean public transport uh, is a way to uh, to go for carbon neutral um, um, planet already and uh, actually charging more for that would be a little bit uh, I don't know not that not that great I think okay understood um I would like to understand, because we are here the panel for small ships, uh, how to make small ships clean. What are the particular challenges for small ships compared, for example, ocean-going vessels? Um, Dirk, you referred earlier to that for ocean-going vessels, uh, wind sails, maybe not so much the option because yeah, it depends very much on the, on the load of cargo that is being transported. But what do you feel, where are the challenges um, particularly for small ships? Well, the challenges, is, uh, to be as just said, is in the moment the regulation authorities. Um, we need more green light from them. You know, I uh, also uh, convert trucks and buses and 40-tonner um, um, trucks and 12-meter uh, public transportation buses to hydrogen. This is the same with authorities, but it's manageable. And um, on small ships, there is no big challenge to convert them. You can convert them. Uh, you can build ships in the same size to make them green. The thing is, they will be much, much more expensive, and that's a challenge of possibly, not of course, of Tobias, especially when you do European tenders. It's uh, very, very difficult to be comparable what is green. Um, but if you are a private owner like I am, others are, um, you can take your ship and convert it. You can make your next one green. 
um, if you have the fuel uh, and all the electricity. And of course, if your customers are ready to pay for it. If I see the trucks um, we are converting, 40 ton a truck, normally costs uh, a truck tractor 120,000, converted one 500,000. It's a lot more, it's four times, but there's an 80% subsidy. It's uh, in Germany nearly 3 billion euros available to convert trucks and buses. On ships, this is not the same thing. On ships, we are in Germany thinking European, we have to apply to European Union, oh, it's so complicated, so how to get the subsidy out for that? Because without that subsidy, we cannot go emission-free so instantly. It will be more slowly changed, like Tobias is facing it now. He wants to do it today. He can't because he has to follow a program. And uh, in public transportation, well, our customers or his customers cannot pay for it. Um, so that is the, I think regulation, subsidy is very important. And uh, what I always claim with the Ministry of Transport in, in Berlin, we need a guideline to bring hydrogen into German ports. German ports, uh, are all like European ports, are mostly run by municipalities. They have all different routes. And we need a common guideline. This is the first China did six years ago to make a guideline on LNG and later on on hydrogen. And now all the provinces can do with that guideline, they can go the way. They have the authority rule book. In Germany, everybody has to invent the wheel not new. I would very much like to hear from the ship operator side of um, point of view how you feel about refits and um, basically what Dirk is suggesting here is uh, from a technical point of view sky is the limit it's all possible and it could be that on a total eco balance it it is maybe eco friendlier to retrofit existing vessels yeah. so how you feel about that no, I totally agree with Dirk and we, we had a good discussion also before we join here um, one of the one of the main points we discuss a lot in this video is like it's it's perfectly fine that we work on options for new builds like like you were doing Tobias, but we have a fleet of 400 plus tags. So if you want to speed your decarbonization journey, retrofit needs to be an option. So for us, it's uh, definitely one of the main hot topics, and and the way we are trying to to go about it is again we cannot try to solve this issue just by ourselves. We need to engage with the industry. We need to engage with our OEM suppliers, and we need to engage with the uh, designer and uh, main engine uh, suppliers. Everybody needs to chip in because at the end of the day, I feel like when, when we discuss in the industry, we talk a lot about new projects and new builds, but I don't hear much about retrofitting. And this is something that can definitely bring a lot of value for everybody and, and, and speed up our decarbonization journey because it's, it's obvious we want to do it, but we're still missing the how. So, so definitely, we believe uh, from the engineering side, everything is, is, is doable. Let's then let's start doing that together and let's finding, defining the options and then let's build a business case. Does it make sense financially, yes or no? And then let's engage with the regulators, let's engage with our clients and see what more can we do together. It, for me, it's clear that uh, just one player or one industry doing something within the maritime, we, we will not achieve the best result. Um, did Hadak also um, um, checked or yeah, evaluated the concept of retrofits? Or I think for our type of ferries that would be very, very demanding. Um, with our new ferry design, um, we are trying to keep all the gas-related uh, uh, equipment as far as possible away from the passenger areas. So I think it would be very, very difficult for a passenger ferry to retrofit uh, gas technology uh, on, on board. Uh, on top of that, our ferries are yeah, running for decades. I mean, we operate them 30 years plus. So uh, um, in, in, in many cases, I think it would not be commercially uh, yeah, feasible to, to retrofit uh, such, a, such a boat. Yeah, in many cases, maybe it would be even more expensive than just building a new one. Yeah, okay. So I think if I may comment, I mean, this is a very good example where when you, depending on the where you are in your life cycle of your asset, then you can decide to go for new uh, or a retrofit. So it makes a lot of sense. The, the other challenge that I want to bring up and say for, for a tag owner operator is that uh, doing the technical feasibility study, it's also not easy because we, we need to define the operating profile of a tag. So. I don't want to bore you about tag jobs. I can talk for many, many hours, but uh, the, the operating profile that we have is that it, it's in, in, in you're mobilizing and demobilizing in, in a very low load operation mode. 
this is fine, you can go with battery, you can go with whatever new technology you can bring in, but once you are doing the tag job itself, you're basically in the mercy of a pilot. So the pilot is telling you now you go 100% load, now go back 40 and then go back again to 80. This creates a lot of spikes in the loads in, and, and, and your load requirements. And that's where the challenge starts from the engineering side of things, when you start looking on, on batteries or when you start looking for other options. So yeah, that's a, that's a challenge we discuss a lot in our office. I can imagine, yes. Well, that's also interesting and maybe also worthwhile pursuing a little longer the question of how much can we actually gain by trying to optimize um, an existing system or how far we need to invent, invent maybe shipping completely new. So the entire logistic chain, um, maybe uh, yeah, it has to be done in a complete different way. Not so much the Haddock ferries, I'll give you that, but uh, for towage it might be, for bunker barges, for pilot vessels, for all these uh, work boats in the port, um, maybe it is time to say, okay, um, yes, we can retrofit, and yes, we can maybe go for solar panels or whatever, but um, under the bottom line, we we will need to think about how we can mo make the port operation um, smarter. What do you think about that, Dirk? Yeah, well, that's a uh, thing of logistics and so on, and um, of course, better organization of workflows. Uh, inside a port, of course, this can be done and this would save things, would save energy. But um, in a port, you have so many players um, and uh, so many systems. If you just look at the Elbe and see what kind of boats going there around of barges and uh, water supply is huge, um, disposal or fuel supply, uh, then there's a cargo barge, uh, then this ferries. And, and I think it's very difficult to make that a logistical masterpiece and save energy out of that. We already do a lot on slow steaming, and um, definitely uh, you could save a lot of money if you make slower steamings, but you would need more ferries. So if that is good, I, I'm quite sure you did that game a lot on your computer, uh, so you end up there where you are. So I think we are already quite optimized in the way how we carry passenger or cargoes uh, and the way we do it, and there's a certain demand for the cargo to be transported at that time on that direction um, in, in this speed and so on. So I think that ball had been played. Um, now it's time to, to change the fuel, to change the propulsion mode, uh, and to see what we can do there, because that is so far not touched yet, really. And this is now the next game we have to play. Okay. Well, yes, thank you. Um, I would like to learn a little bit more about the, because we heard now there are um, a lot of potentials and uh, things that needs to be pursued. Um, but what are, in your opinion, really the low-hanging fruits for um, short-term gains? What can be done um, yeah, now, now, to already generate savings on emissions now? Um, I think, yeah. Evan, please. Yeah, I can start and say that w when you look again on the decarbonization journey, there is three routes you can take. One is the behavioral part, which is for me the low-hanging fruit right now. The other one is what is your equipment doing? And then the other one is where what, what, what are you gonna burn on this equipment, right? So the, the last two, I think we talked a lot right now, but one of the things that we have done, and you know very well, and Karsten knows very well, is that we, we have engaged into, into this behavioral mode, where can, what can we do to change that behavior, like Dirk was mentioning. So one of the, yeah, we have Port Tracker as a, as a tool that we have implemented in, in, in quite some ports uh, globally, and then we, we basically monitor in a way, we are checking through the AIS data, you know, the, the whole movements within the port and our tags and, and, and the, mo the, the, the only part that you can really influence, as I said before, is the mobilization and the demobilization. So thr through this tool, we have a good understanding of how our tags are operating on these uh, sections of the operation, and then we engage into real good discussions with our masters and trying to find a way where we can optimize this. And, and I can tell you we have had it now for three years and it has given quite a lot of uh, uh, good feedback on, on our fuel efficiency. So this is one part and then the, the other part that we look a lot is obviously biofuels and they need to be the right biofuels that they are environmental friendly. And, and we look at that uh, to, to my understanding in our discussions with our OEMs, I mean there is not a big challenge on burning biofuel right here, right now. So if you 
if you're in a particular port where you can uh, find the right supply of biofuel and uh, find it at the right price, uh, then, then, then you can do a lot actually on this low hanging fruit. But this is only addressing right here, right now, and, and it this is will not give you your incremental um, benefit on your decarbonization journey. So for sure you need to look on, on, on uh, like Dirk said, on, on new ways and and, uh, and new fuels and, and, and actually change the mindset within the towing industry. I really believe that. Okay. Um, as a closing question, I would like to know from you gentlemen with whom in the industry you'd like to engage in a project um, to gain specific um, yeah, learnings or insights on how what, what can be done to improve. Um, yeah, it can be someone within the panelists, it can be someone like Elon Musk, but maybe just to give us an idea of uh, what you and your organization are currently thinking and with whom you'd like to connect to make that happen. Uh, maybe Tobias, you wanna start. Yeah, okay. Um, so the bureaucratic answer to that question is that all my projects are up for tenders, so <laughs> I cannot really okay. answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well. Um <laughs> But maybe you can make a wish, send it to the universe yeah, um, aside from the bureaucratic borders of yeah. what can be done. I, I think th what we all need is people with the right mindset. And I mean, Elon Musk, uh, of course, is one of those guys who actually is uh, uh, somebody who wants, wants to make things happen. We, we need people in, in our industry and also for our projects that have exactly that mindset. Uh, and. Uh, I mean, there is a lot, so many companies out there and investors that want to make green projects happen and they are suffering because there is so much bureaucracy and uh, so many challenges in the approval processes that I think we need uh, more people everywhere that uh, not default to no, but default to yes, let's make it happen. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Evangelos. Yeah, for me, uh, there, there is two elements again here. One is that the I'm looking a lot at our OEM suppliers, uh, like main engine suppliers, for example. You know, w we are really need to sit down and collaborate because this is a, a problem that if I was working for a uh, main engine supplier, I will do everything to find out what's the future fuel and how I can build that engine. And, and I think there is an element here where we can collaborate together and and Zwitscher can bring, or any towing company can bring their operational experience and talk about the challenges that we just talked, and then collaborate with, uh, with the OEMs and, and work on a solution. That's number one. And number two is that also came into my mind while we ha I have been here, is I think we need to give the shot to our startups because that's where maybe new minds come in where they think differently and they can work together and they can come with a crazy solution that we might think is crazy, but actually it works and, and I think as an industry, we need to be better and more open to, to engage into this discussion and collaborate more together. So this is uh, one of yeah, my dreams. As a team member of NaviSense, I can only support that full-heartedly. <laughs> um, Dirk, you as a really true entrepreneur, what you th with whom would you like to collaborate and, and invest or investigate or do some research to find new ideas? Yeah, I don't want to do research because everything is available. No <laughs> okay. research needed. Uh, it needs to be done. I want to operate, uh, so my wish list is a fuel station for hydrogen inside the port of Hamburg now. Um, so, so I want to work together with guys who is making that regulatory viable. Uh, I have guys to do the fuel station. I have investors for that. But um, I would ready. invest myself uh, now I need regulation. Yes. Um, and the other thing is regarding ship owners. I want to work together with ship owners and operators to convert vessels to think about new ideas, new ships, uh, and uh, do that clean from the beginning. So concluding basically means that all of you um, just may more or less are ready to go. Yeah. Um, we just need <laughs> yes. more people who are um, yeah, like-minded and have more can-do attitude and are more enablers rather than people who have a long list of problems and laws and regulation that need to be met and uh, just make it happen. Okay, I think that's uh, that's quite good outlook, I would say. Um, and I thank you very much for your time, for your insight, um, for your openness, and yes, looking forward now to the next panel. And uh, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.